Could you be in an abusive relationship and not even realize you're in one? Could you imagine that your abusive partner or parent or boss or someone else is actually the most special relationship that you've ever had? Yes. My name's Ruthann. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm an expert in relationships and issues of narcissism. And in this video, I'm going to explain to you why some people become blind to the abuse that they're experiencing in their relationships. There's a theory from social psychology from the 1950s, and it's called the theory of cognitive dissonance. And it was first proposed by a psychologist called Leon Festinger. And Festinger observed members of a doomsday cult. And the members of this cult believed that the world was going to come to an end on the 21st of December, 1954. And in preparation for the end of the world, they, they were really serious. They really believed it. They sold their possessions. They quit their jobs. And they gathered, uh, expecting that the world was going to be destroyed by aliens. So what happened when the prophecy wasn't fulfilled? Did they give up their beliefs? Did they go back to normal life? No. Actually, they reinterpreted the world not ending as evidence that they were right, that the world was going to end, but that aliens intervened to prevent the end of the world in order to save the cult. And in fact, it strengthened their conviction and their commitment to the group that they were in. So was this something about the psychology of cult members that makes them vulnerable to adopting what most of us would consider fairly outlandish beliefs and being really committed to them even in the face of evidence to the contrary? No, in fact, cognitive dissonance is a very ordinary, normal human phenomenon. Cognitive dissonance is about inconsistency. When we have inconsistency between our beliefs, so we hold contradictory beliefs, or if we have inconsistency between our beliefs and our experiences, we feel uncomfortable. We feel emotional distress. It's disturbing to us emotionally. We feel disturbed in our body and we become motivated to resolve the dissonance. And in order to resolve the dissonance, very often we don't necessarily change our beliefs to fit with the reality of our experiences. We change our interpretation of our situation. And there's some really interesting examples of this from psychology experiments in the 1950s. In one such experiment, Festinger took students and he made them do a very tedious task. They had to turn pegs on a pegboard boring, boring, boring. And then they had to lie. They had to tell the next person coming in to do the task that it was a really interesting and enjoyable task. And some people were paid $1 to tell a lie and the other people were paid $20 to tell a lie. Afterwards, the students were asked how interesting they found taking part in the experiment. The students who were paid $20 to lie and say that they found the task interesting said that they found the task boring. They rated the task as quite tedious, which indeed it was. But the students who were paid $1, they rated the task as enjoyable. Why? Well, because they didn't have enough of an incentive to lie. So the students who were paid $20 were like, yeah, I had the incentive to lie. So yeah, I told a lie. The students who were paid $1, they didn't have quite enough incentive. So they had to find a way to justify why it was that they told a lie. So they reinterpreted their experiences and said that they found a tedious task interesting rather than acknowledge, yeah, I told a lie. In another study, Aronson took female students, and this was the 1950s, so female students in the 1950s, and they were invited to take part in a study of the psychology of sex. And he asked some of those female students to read aloud a series of sexual words to a male experimenter. And those words included things like prostitution and sex. That was considered to be mildly embarrassing. Other female students were asked to read a very sexually explicit passage with obscene language to the male experimenters. And that was classed as severely embarrassing. Then they were asked how they experienced the task. Now, which group of students do you think said they enjoyed the task more? Well, it was the students in the extremely embarrassing condition. Why? Well, they volunteered to do it. They were there of their own free will. And rather than acknowledge to themselves, like, I made a mistake, I did this thing, it was really embarrassing, they justified it to themselves by saying it was actually interesting and enjoyable. 
So cognitive dissonance and the discomfort we feel and the tendency to reinterpret our experience to fit with our beliefs is not a pathological phenomenon. It's not a sign that you're mentally disordered. It's not a sign that you're a strange person. In fact, it's completely normal and it's something that all human beings do. So how is this relevant to narcissistic relationships? Well, narcissistic relationships are the very definition of inconsistent. Narcissistic people are kind and loving one minute, promising you the world and how amazing things are going to be. And then switching to being degrading, condescending, critical and abusive. And then back again to being loving and telling you how amazing things are going to be, usually one day in the future. Now, you probably don't see yourself as someone who's a victim of abuse. You may see yourself as someone who doesn't tolerate fools gladly. You might see yourself as someone who values good and healthy relationships and someone who's good at interpersonal skills. So how do you square your beliefs and your sense of yourself with the way that you're being treated in your relationship? So when there's a big mismatch between how you see yourself in a relationship and your experience of your actual relationship, you experience strong cognitive dissonance. Your ordinary human psychology works against you in this situation. It is excruciatingly painful to take a step back and look at your relationship for what it is and to be honest with yourself about the situation that you've ended up in. The more comfortable thing to do is to make justifications for the behavior. Well, they're tired, they were drinking a bit. They have a lot on at the moment. They had a difficult childhood. I understand where this behavior comes from. And as well as justifying the bad behavior of the other person, you start to blame yourself. Maybe I wasn't considerate enough. Maybe I was unreasonable. Maybe I had too high expectations. Maybe I was impatient and so on and so on. In a narcissistic relationship, this can become a very vicious cycle. So you get into this relationship, you form all these hopes and dreams about what an amazing relationship it's going to be. You develop a very strong belief that this is a great relationship and this person is very, very special to you. Then you experience abusive behaviors. Then you justify those abusive behaviors or you take the responsibility for those abusive behaviors onto you and you work even harder and you put even more into that relationship. The harder you work, the more effort that you put into this relationship to trying to make it work, to trying to be the best partner you can be, trying to placate this person who's abusing you, the stronger your dissonance becomes, and therefore the stronger your need to justify their behavior and blame yourself. What a vicious cycle this can become. I want you to know that if you're in that situation and you find yourself in strong cognitive dissonance, making excuses for things that you find really indefensible, blaming yourself for things that have absolutely nothing to do with you. I want you to know that that is not a sign that you're abnormal. It's not a sign that you're stupid. It's not a sign that you have poor interpersonal or relationship skills. And it's not a sign that you're mentally disordered. It is your ordinary human psychology that is unfortunately working against you in this situation. Now, there's another reason that this becomes extremely challenging for people in narcissistic relationships. Narcissistic partners or parents or whoever it may be are demanding and they take up your time. They take up your energy. They take up your emotional resources. So there's very little left for you. Looking at your situation honestly and really understanding what's going on and seeing what's going on takes energy. It takes incredible courage to do that. And when you're in a narcissistic relationship, finding the space, the time and the energy and the emotional resources to have that kind of honesty with yourself is incredibly difficult. So what can you do if you're in that situation? So number one, and I cannot stress this enough, Understand that this is normal human psychology. It is not a sign that you're abnormal. It's not a sign that you're weird. It's not a sign that you have a mental disorder. It's a perfectly understandable part of the human condition. Understand that good, kind, smart people who are very capable of respectful and reciprocal relationships can find themselves in abusive relationships. No one is immune to abuse. If you can, see if you can find some space away from the narcissistic person, some space that's for you. 
Give yourself the opportunity to explore what's happening slowly, to pick through it methodically, and to be really, really honest with yourself. It can be helpful to do that with a therapist who has experience in working with survivors of narcissistic abuse. You may also find that you have friends or family who might be able to hold that kind of space for you and allow you to explore and think through what's happening. And it's very important in that situation that you don't feel under pressure to declare, well, this is an abusive relationship. I need to just get out immediately. That's not how this process works. Very often that end point where someone says, that's it, this person is abusing me and I need to get out and I need to go is sometimes the end stage of quite a long period of thinking things through and having the courage to look at what's actually going on. Most of all, be very gentle and compassionate with yourself. Don't blame yourself. Don't beat yourself up as you recognize that you've been in an abusive relationship. The story you tell yourself about this is really important. If you're saying, I'm such an idiot to have been in that relationship, that's going to create more dissonance because you probably don't really see yourself as an idiot. And then you're motivated to defend the relationship. Really understand anyone can end up in an abusive relationship. Anyone can end up justifying behaviors that they would otherwise find indefensible. And anyone can end up blaming themselves for things that are not their fault. You are ordinary and human and you are deserving of respectful, caring relationships where you're treated with basic human decency and courtesy. Be patient with yourself and welcome difficult emotions. When you evaluate an abusive relationship from a place of honesty, it provokes a lot of difficult, difficult feelings. You may feel embarrassed and ashamed to find yourself in this situation. You may feel deep regret about what you've lost. You may feel guilty for the effect that this relationship has had on you and perhaps also on people you care about. You may feel anxious thinking, what do I do now? What an overwhelming situation. How do I get myself out of it? And how do I manage my relationship with this person who is abusive to me and who is not likely to stop being abusive to me? Those are difficult and painful emotions to work through. So be patient, be kind. If you can see a therapist who has skills in narcissistic abuse, that's likely to be very helpful to you. If you can embrace those emotions, if you can embrace that dissonance, as painful as it may be, you will give yourself the most wonderful gift of honesty, of validation, and clear-sightedness. I hope this video has been helpful. I'd love to hear what you think, so leave a comment. If you liked it, please hit the like button and subscribe so you can see more on issues of narcissism and recovery after narcissistic abuse. I look forward to seeing you next time. In the meantime, take good care.